Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Today I'm talking to Dallas-based artist Brian Keith Jones. He's mostly known for being half of the artistic duo Chuck and George, along with Brian Scott. And we talk about that a little bit in this video, and we also um, go beneath the somewhat grotesque surface and fun carnival vibes of his work into the depths, we'll say, we'll just say into the depths. And I think that I came away from this conversation, even though I've known Brian for like 30 years or so, um, feeling like I had a deeper understanding of everything that he's produced so far. And we talk about some of his, um, ideas for what's coming up and, um, it was just really fun because, like I said, I've known him for a really long time, but we've actually never like sat down and had a one-on-one -on -one conversation together. So um, it was really great. And I uh, am really grateful to Brian for doing this and for being vulnerable. Um, there's a lot of vulnerability in this. And we talked for a long time and there's going to definitely be a, a bonus video. So make sure you are subscribed so you'll get the notification for that. And um, I think that's it. So we'll just jump into the conversation in progress. Like really, really, really a long time coming. Yes. And I'm, I'm excited. I'm very excited to talk to Brian <laughs> Jones all by myself. <laughs> I kind of considered myself from San Antonio. Yeah, I remember that about you. I got an advertising degree at, at SAC. Which okay. I abso absolutely, SAC was my best educational uh, experience I've ever had. Yeah, was, better than North school. Texas? As far as uh, what I gained out of it, in a way, yeah. in my head, my yeah. headspace, so to speak, and, and art artistically, yes. Yeah, um, I got my, I got my, I don't know, I got my artsy brain at UNT, I suppose, yeah. uh, because most of that's because of the fellow students, not exactly staff or the, you know, just, just the students. I the, do know. Yeah. I share you know, that. that. You know, the, the, the Denton in energy, you know. Oh, yeah. Art. It's a vortex. Like once you have gone through the Denton yeah. vortex, you can never, ever, ever escape it. And it's, like all of your, all of your most meaningful, like I have a lot of meaningful connections from various parts uh -huh. of my life, but there's something about those Denton connections. I didn't want to be that person, but yeah. we, are. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we love when we, if if we are invited to give art talks there or anything, it's it's yeah. such a wonderful experience. We always have uh, young friends there. They recently expanded our visual speed bump art tour uh -huh. out there, so it's franchised to Denton. Really? Well, that's and cool. It is cool. It feels so good. It feels like it feels like being hugged. Yeah. When, when, How did that come come about? Uh, we were contacted by uh, Delaney Smith. Uh -huh. and they wanted. They really had enjoyed experiencing our, our Oak Cliff, Dallas, Texas, uh, uh, visual speed bump art tour. Yeah, and they they really liked that energy and they they in that way of connecting to uh, people groups, you know, and uh, just new faces and uh, and and they loved that that experience that they wanted to do that for themselves. And uh, they did last year, they, they did a, I call it baby bump sometimes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like that. We, we went, they, they have it the week after hours. Okay, ours, good. Ours is on May 18th this year. And uh -huh. I, I scheduled it this weekend and they immediately scheduled theirs for the week after. And it's one of those things I get excited by our own event and the fact that we can actually visit another yeah. you know, another one. Yeah, that's great. I love the scale of it. 
Like they do that oh. in Austin, the the East Austin. Well, it's changed names. I don't even know what it's called now. The Austin Studio Tour, I guess. Now it's like three, four weekends long. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's it's, it's overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. And I I participated in it once where I had people coming to my house, and I was just it, like it was too much. Like there were <laughs> so many people at points that. Like one, I felt, I just felt uncomfortable, like with all those people in my house. And I didn't, I wasn't able to like, I didn't know who they were. I wasn't able to like kind of keep tabs on like where everybody was in the house. And, and, you know, I'm sure it was fine, but it just was kind <laughs> of like all of a sudden it went from zero people in my house to like zero to 50, 50 to their and they're all total strangers you know yeah. and um it just was like you couldn't have conversations with people and because it was just is too much I don't know I mean it was nice like I, I sold some stuff and that's always great but it's, we've made a lot of contacts with musicians other artists, collectors, and, and just all kinds of people who uh, go on this tour. And uh, I, I enjoy going on the other Dallas tours as well. The uh, the Cedars has a really nice one every year in yeah. November. Um, ours turned 20. We had our 23rd one last year. Yeah. 23rd. And um, had two nice articles uh -huh. about it. And it's a small tour because uh, uh, Oak Cliff is not a place that artists, artists can't afford studios anymore. Right. Uh, I kind of dig having a lot of strangers in my home. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you it's, guys are always the party hosts. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of it. And, 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 and yeah. we often during, during the event, you know, our couch will fill up with friends that are visiting. And, and I'm like, I'm thinking they've been on this couch for over 20 minutes and there's other places for them to go and i, I had to sit, remind them this is not a party it's not a party right. go see some other places you know get off my couch yeah. you're blocking the art you yeah. know and, uh, but and, your house is like a work of art in and of itself you know <laughs> and just like going into your house is just it's like entering a wonderland like Alec you're going you've gone down the rabbit hole into where all this like magical I mean everything that's behind you is a great example of that but that's just like one little snip. yeah that's, that that's yeah that's a that's the storage bench wow. <laughs> in the living room but yeah. besides our, I mean the own the attention we get ourselves with our own art here it's it's I love showing off the idea of having an art collection and what living with art is like and uh and, and we do definitely live with art and, yeah. and, and collection does change frequently um little pieces in little pieces out you know and uh it's when, when we were we we were still in school when we first got collected and um we were invited to the collector's home it, uh, which you've probably been there sunny Burt and bob butler I have not. Oh, it's uh they are they have since passed on. They were a lovely couple. Um they um had a nice house. They were one of them was an architect and they had this rather large um house that they had designed themselves and it was just full of so much local artists and Rosenbergs and uh, you know, Lichtensteins and everyone you could probably think about in some in some fashion and they even had a artist t-shirt collection that they showed in their in their library wow and it was it was so i was so impressed and 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 jealous of how much art they were just sitting in you know the uh -huh. cheers and and i thought i thought this is what i want to be when i grow up but yeah. the poor version of course right exactly <laughs> I'm an artist you know and yeah uh, so uh, the nice thing about that is that you can um exchange mm -hmm. with other artists too you know um so there's there's that edge
just to like pause really quickly because yeah. I know your history, but people watching this video might not. So when we were talking about we, it's oh, you yeah. and it's Brian Scott. And do you want to kind of explain like what that connection is? And because oh. y'all, you know, you're making art together. You're like doing the studio tour together. It, it's, it's a lot. Um, so Brian and I, Brian and I, we both have the same middle name as well. Um, Brian Keith Scott, Brian Keith Jones. Okay, nice. <laughs> Jones. Uh, we we met at school at Ditton in, in 1990 and uh, uh, just kind of decided, you know, that we're going to collaborate, you know, have some sort of relationship. Mm -hmm. But it was, I was really interested in collaborating for sure. Yeah. And, uh, we just kind of went from there. Brian was a printmaker and I was a painting major. Um, and we just went from there. We kind of started doing, um, we, we were angry students, you know, as a lot of us, us were back then. Yeah. And we, we, Brian and I would, uh, take classes together and kind of, uh, be kind of subversive. And, uh, we, we started, we just kind of like wondering why so many of the students act like they're being forced to be art majors somehow he's like they don't they never would do their assignments their homework they didn't they didn't seem to have a desire to yeah. make art and um so we were just like are your are their parents forcing them to be art majors <laughs> yeah they just didn't they just didn't have the same you know uh feelings for it i thought that that maybe we did and uh uh, and we were kind of outsider as far as uh, our acceptance from other professors and things like that. We weren't star students. Mm -hmm. We were, uh, I was a figurative artist and um, that wasn't acceptable in the 90s. At right. UNT, kind yep. of thing. I mean, just painting in the 90s. <laughs> Knowing what a brush is, you know. Right. <laughs> so Brian, Brian and I would, uh, we would get the class early if we had a class together and during critique days and we'd whip some crap out, you know, something, uh, post skills and, uh, just throw something together and, uh, and hang it on the wall, mm -hmm. uh, in an anonymous way and then have a critique. It would be ready for critique. And, uh, that's where we invented Chuck and George as kind of a, uh, subversive, uh, you know, game, I suppose, yeah. an act of cruelty, bullying, I don't know. And, uh, but we started, that work started, being invited into shows and things and I really didn't want to be that artist you know I had my own stuff I yeah. had the stuff that we had the stuff that we wanted to do together and uh that wasn't uh just a prank or something right. <laughs> you know? and uh so we, we started and then and the name we get we the name Chuck and George came from it, it's it's very similar to Gilbert and George, of course, who we are fans of. But um, I had a, uh, I used to have imaginary friends. Yeah. And, and I used to have unimaginary friends too. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, I was getting rid of all of them. And uh, I, I kind of developed uh, this character named Chuck, who was a uh, kind of it was kind of me it was uh, like a hermunculus is it how you say it hermunculus the yeah. little thing goes kill him, yeah. kill him. <laughs> you know and uh so I, I was i had developed this in in my art this character um and he was an, a uh a surrogate brother so to speak and uh and when i met brian he had a stick named george that yeah. he was art about and with and uh, we just kind of put our peanut butter with our chocolate and uh, yeah, doing it pretty good, you know, pretty, pretty. Yeah. Um, we've missed 10 years once, but uh, we stayed on target the rest of the time. We have our solo careers as well. You know, there, there's so many reasons to make art. There's so many, you know, if, if you could find motivation and in, in whatever your cruelty or... <laughs> or subversiveness or, or just, you know, collaborative. It's just, it just kind of keeps it interesting. Mm -hmm. It keeps it kind of fun. And, and, and if you, if you know anything about our art, it's, it's, it, we kind of like to have fun. 
Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, we've I've had a lot of young artists tell us that they never felt like they had permission to have fun until they saw uh, our shows or something. And yeah. they would like, art can be fun, you know? Right. And Life simply, can be fun. Life can be fun. <laughs> if only people let us. <laughs> right. So do you think that, um, you know, you said there's like, there's a lot of reasons to, to make art. Is that, um, is that one of the primary motivations for you or drivers? Motivations might not be the right word, but impulses yeah it's impulses and um i think i think as a, a when i was younger it was kind of um we didn't have you know we didn't have uh telephones video game I mean, we did have video games but you know pong right it imaginative and um but and, and i just didn't get into them as much I, I i lived in alaska for about seven years when i was a child we would drive back and forth from san antonio to alaska and um it gets cold and and dark and um i we did a lot of art we didn't we didn't have a lot of my me and my my brother uh weren't allowed to have very many toys because the toy box had to be closable uh-huh and if it wasn't, we had to get rid of something. So we had a very small amount of like actual toys and the rest of it was, uh, my, my dad was kind of a thief and he worked at a, he was in the military. He worked as a, in a supply unit. And mm -hmm. so, um, we as children had had a lot of typing paper, typewriters, ballpoint pens, plastiline clay, and it was just craft day every day or freeze to death outside. Right. <laughs> Um, I did hook rugs and things like that. So I had, I had art was, um, and I didn't have a lot of friends um, when I was a kid. So I, I had art and, and, I, and I did do horrible, evil things with it often. And, um, Such as? Uh, I always got uh, in trouble for drawing my teachers. Uh -huh. I would often make masks. I would just draw on paper and, and poke holes with my glasses that way they would affix to my face with my glasses yeah and paper and and I'd wear that during the class and the teacher would get mad because it was down and uh right. at once I I got caught drawing my favorite teacher being decapitated oh. <laughs> by Eddie the head uh, the these Eddie days the head. yeah that would, yeah that would have a yeah. whole different effect I'm yeah. sure that they were not appreciative back then but you would <laughs> You'd get on some list for sure. I think that I think the teacher I was I was actually doing well and it was a geometry class and I was actually doing very well in that class, shockingly. And um the teacher who caught me drawing her being decapitated by Eddie the Head, the zombie uh mascot of Iron Maiden. Yeah. Uh, it was a commission piece. Yeah. It was being commissioned. Um <laughs> the kid was he offered me a, a hit of a tab of acid or five dollars <laughs> and and I I wouldn't go near the acid so I'd like five dollars hey yeah uh, that's a lot of money for me and uh yeah I did it but I got caught and uh I became the pet student that sat next to her, uh -huh. her she would send me to the office with papers and things like that and so she 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 treated me with respect and and kind of love and and kindness you know and 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 it was a nice way of uh, allowing my own guilt to express itself. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Yeah. That's a nice end to that story. <laughs> yes. Um, you said you made masks a lot. And I mean, on the wall behind you, yeah. <laughs> there's even a couple, like that's definitely something that you still do. Yes. And our, also our... you are like, you know, there's the, the one behind you with the like double glasses and then the big text on fire, like you are in your artwork, like yes. a lot. And in a way it's kind of like, uh, and you've, you know, created this alter ego Chuck, like huh. it's this whole sort of like um, different ways of playing with the mask of like who who is brian keith jones and yeah you know who does he want to be yeah um, um 
yeah th there's there, there's the a lot of identity things going on here i suppose and uh i am the big text if you see me painting big text i am the crappity elf it it always it does it's weird i'm not ego i'm not an ego freak i don't think but um no i don't think you are either it's it's just i to even to myself i'm quite a mystery yeah we do level mystery but I, I you know you, you're always trying to figure out who you are and where you are where you fit in and and uh uh and it's i i haven't even delved into my uh core child being who who i'm saving it for my adult work strange enough yeah and his name is which is my nickname beanie okay. and and I have a series of uh, story related pieces that I want to make. And it's it's the first one is uh, the body of the work is called Beanie Pees Red, which I used to pee red as a child uh, through some whatever fluke. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, you, you spend a lot of your life trying to decipher what actually happened in your childhood. Yeah. In ways. And, and, I, and I, I was the kid. I was this little big headed kid with these big eyes and I would just, I would not look away from things. I would just, I didn't hide uh, from horrible things or unexplainable things. I just kind of like, this is interesting, you know, and uh, I was such a movie freak and uh, that if whenever really crazy things are happening in my life that I, I am having a panic or I'm freaking out I just sometimes think if this was in the movie this would be a good part of the movie you yeah, know? yeah it's you know what what is a protagonist without yeah I mean that's I think that's a healthy way of sort of the whole observing the self thing to take yourself out of that moment of mm -hmm. of intense emotion yes know? It, 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 you know, cause I didn't understand, you know, you don't understand things. So I didn't, I wouldn't make the decision to feel so victimized or, or, or upset about things because I wanted to understand things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, um, and sometimes, you know, you ever have a moment where you're, you look back on something that happened like a hundred years ago in your life and you're like, Oh, you finally get it. You know, you oh, finally all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like because you you, you hang on to those little mysteries yeah. because they might get solved later. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a really good way to do that is to move in with your parents when you're 50. <laughs> yes. I can't imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all that all that inner child work that I didn't intend to do, I've <laughs> I've done now. So <laughs> You Check been, that off the list. It's into your room by yourself. <laughs> yeah, which is what I did my whole entire teenage, you know, years. So, um, yeah, I mean, you should um, let that relate. You should, are you going to let that seep into your art, that experience? I think, I mean, it already does, but not yeah. explicitly, you know, um, there's so many layers to it, you know, that I didn't, I mean, I moved here out of, uh, out of need, you know, not being able to afford living in Austin as a single mom who, who already wasn't like, um, making ends meet in the publishing world, but then also decided, um, screw that world. I'm going to be an artist, which is what I always intended to do. So, you know, complicated things but um you know there's all that inner child shadow work that I've been doing but yeah. also like I have so many friends and we have a mutual friend you know who mm -hmm. just lost a parent uh, yeah. in the past few years who have lost either one or both of their parents and I just know that like I'm I'm never ever ever going to regret this time you know no, no. so um it's been it's 
it's come with like it's a very unique set of challenges and a very unique set of gifts and rewards yeah. you know you have, um, you have to get over old, old habits of how you relate yeah. to each other yeah and yeah, you know that this has gone on for a while now like i've been here since um the the very end of 2019 and uh -huh. and at that point it was supposed to be temporary and then pandemic hit and then like by the time that was over it was like i was here and you know very entrenched in like well i'm making art now and not making enough income to like move so yeah uh, it's just it's gone on a lot longer than i thought but there's definitely been like stages of, you know, <laughs> of the regression, uh -huh. in, like <laughs> old patterns and dynamics. And there, there definitely was a point where I was just like, this is like 1987 right now. Like the way that I was at that time and the way that my mom was at that time, like we just like all of a sudden we're there. Uh -huh. then and then we kind of got past that you know everything's great now honestly I think everybody like is in my whole whole family is getting along really really well and um and, and I I think that I do think that a lot of that has to do with the fact that I just like went straight into the belly of the beast and yeah you know um have had a lot more time in contact with everybody but um yeah but, but both your parents are alive they are yeah that is, that is so unusual and and so many my dad passed away when i was 12 yeah he he was i'm i don't know i have so much of him in me yeah and, and his influence he was the movie lover we, we our family was i would say a, a barely a generation away from uh, um, illiteracy. I, I have I've had illiterate cousins, mm -hmm. and it, it bothered me greatly because being um, they're they're all from Tennessee. Uh, being who they are, my parents, we went to the library every every week. We had family day at the library. Yeah, we were book book. We had all the encyclopedias. We were still poor, mm -hmm. but we you know we had things that were we were rich with and, and that was the you know desire to read books look at books make art yeah and, and my mom passed away um maybe 2017 I don't really remember I, she hasn't she hadn't been happy since 1979 when my dad passed away and so uh I I was relieved in a way when she passed away because she was as much as I loved her mm -hmm. was in a very intense uh mentally imbalanced person full of love and hate yeah. And, yeah and was um undefinable and yeah. so many could be so much fun and then I would be afraid of her um which I did not like uh and so i whenever she, she would she would have moments where she was tearing the curtains down and setting them on fire kind of thing and uh just going a berserk and uh it went it got worse when after she had my little brother um i think it was part of the postpartum i think yeah, and, and it's real she, she was in her uh mid to late she was about 36 when she had him Mm -hmm. So, um, and, uh, I, she probably did do drugs then as well, but, and drink, but just, uh, her, her intensity, it was one of those moments when, when I would think if this was in a movie, you know, as she's burning the curtains or driving yeah. the car through the living room out of some rage. And I, I thought if this is going to be a good movie, you yeah. know, yeah. Yeah. And I used to think I, I I wanted to make a movie about her and my life as, as, as when I was younger, and uh, it um, I never done. It. I did become a film. I was a film minor at mm -hmm. school, thinking the the possibilities of that, and I, 
it just yeah. never I haven't even made art about it honestly yeah, yeah. so so I, I, I don't know what, what I'm waiting for my mom's passed away I'm over 50 yeah and uh Brian and I got to have lunch with John Waters once. And, oh, uh, wow. And, um, he was, cool. It was cool. And he was very nice. Um, he We had offered to have an after party for one of his shows uh, through the uh, Word Space group, which is a <laughs> literary uh, uh, group here in Dallas. And uh, Brian, the other Brian, often has like, what do you call it? Not dilettante, uh, art, art ambassador kind of things that we do like picking Amy Sedaris up at the airport or something like that or you know and Dan Savage and 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 just helping them set up shows or and so uh we offered to have a little after party for John Waters and he's like what well, how about lunch instead so mm -hmm. and if you ever want to have lunch with somebody offer them something else <laughs> right <laughs> but I feel like he missed a golden opportunity I feel like had he known what like treasure had awaited him at a party at your house oh, like it was especially across the street is the divine shrine there's yeah. a, a shrine to, did you see that yet no i haven't i don't see that it's yeah. the guy across the street works for homeland security has a has a shrine to divine the actor actress in the first few rooms of his house and it has wigs and eyelashes and birth certificates death certificates everything he's like insane for it Wow, and that's that's on our studio tour. There. Okay, yeah. I gotta I, come up this year. You got to. <laughs> yeah, I need you for sure. Do you feel like that? Um, do you feel like that doing some sort of artwork or creative project, you know, film or um, paintings or whatever, like? that would be explicitly about your mother and your relationship with her um you said you know that you don't know why you've been waiting so long so is it something that you you kind of feel like a compulsion that you need you need to do that at some point in your life I, I do because um it's it's all stories um I, I've so many people say you need to write a book and make a movie. And John Waters said that to me. He, yeah. he, I, he was coached and asked me a, a question about my mother. And I don't know what I said, but he, his mouth fell open mm -hmm. and told me that. And, and I thought, this is, this is wh wh where do you draw the line and, and what motivation you get, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and, and that kind of really lit it up for me a little bit. I knew I was, I'm not, not going to make a movie or anything, but I'm not even going to write a story. Honestly, I just want, uh, I, I, I thought about doing it in zine form at first. Um, comic books, zines, um, are so there's a, there's a lot of work. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. Uh, and people value them so little. Uh, I, I did, I did a zine and, um, I did charge 40 bucks for it instead of $2. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a limited edition signed and autographed and and but forty dollars is really not that much um and I, I'm, i've had several friends that were like that's too much and i'm like well don't you print things out on your hp printer and then charge 150 for it yeah. and i'm like this is, this is a story with a centerfold right you know, and an image and hundreds of images it's like yeah that's a lot of work it's so all much about work perception you know yeah. um how, how do you how do you get to this how, when, how do you know when you're at the center of a, a story to where you have a centerfold you know so it's like my brain just doesn't work in that fashion and so I I, I have come to a, a, a an approach finally mm -hmm. so I'm waiting all my life for this but I, I I do book restoration for a living and uh, as a job and that they'll say living and uh and um so i i i'm always reconstructing a lot of children's books and things like that and and so i, I thought my stories are going to be fractured when i when i make them i will make 
a torn cover perhaps and a few pages that are left from the story yeah but most people that know me well will know the story and and so i i, I thought if i create a, a legitimate printing process like like screen printing or mm -hmm. um some sort of printing system for the pages and then i then i could have a a show of uh it'll it'll be on the wall but it'll be torn covers and you know because there was a lot of violence in the family and um just kind of shredded memories there and uh yeah. and uh and each one would be a little different even though it's a print and it'd be limited but i thought i thought i could at least get out the gist of each story yeah with, with each cover and uh, enough to understand what's going on a bit and appreciate it without too much of this and letting the story remain a story uh -huh. and, and, and these are just the fractured you know remnants of it yeah <laughs> so when you um when you say that you kind of have arrived at this like uh with with the format with yeah the delivery method of of how you're gonna convey this stuff um what's your your creative process like like how do you get to that point where you're like oh i think i understand it now yeah i i, I think i needed uh design research mm -hmm. and uh, this is when my advertising degree comes in yeah. um doing a uh, little thumbnail sketches you know and, and then growing those from uh to larger ideas and 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 just the visual aspects of things and and what to what to not put into the broken books what what is you know and, and character development i yeah. have to i have to know because i i think each book might be a slightly different style even you know i'll have you know and because i'm i can do that i yeah. know so that's uh, really cool. I'm I'm working on some books right now too. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's really interesting that you're you're Booking. similar. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like that's like I have that publishing background. Yeah. But like, you know, oh always my whole life, like I wanted to make books. And uh -huh. I just I love I love books. I love holding them. I love everything about books and um so I have like these past um, several years while I've been here, um, you know, I've had like a couple of series of paintings that I've been working on and other, some other projects. Like I always have a lot of things that I'm working on at once uh -huh. and I, I kind of go back and forth and it, it, they all, they all kind of feed each other, even though it's not necessarily obvious that that's happening. Um, but I have just like stacks of notebooks that have just like very, very raw writing in it. Yeah. And, and then like, you know, scribbles and of sketches and like just notes of ideas. Um, and it's like, all of a sudden it feels like it's time to like go into those uh -huh. find all of that and like bring all that stuff that's really raw into um into f like some kind of form and um like in the same way that you were saying like they're all kind of be kind of different like that's my thinking as well except that I'm thinking of them kind of as like a serial so they'll all have sort of they'll, ha they'll all have like a uniform package you know yeah like same dimensions and mm -hmm. and delivery style and it's much more like a traditional like book but some yeah. of them are some of them are like you know texts and images and some of them are just like a bunch of stuff like in there and some of them have <laughs> recipes in them you know it's just like <laughs> there's a lot of books with recipes that's yeah. my, my second favorite book to repair is recipe books oh like really love the children's books and then I love repairing recipe books and I think mostly because they're not bibles and uh and they're not uh civil war you know confederate oh. memorabilia <laughs> and 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 so it's like 
uh, you take the politics out of that um, that book, and 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 you're hoping you're doing a great job. And when they pick their book up, they'll cry because you repaired a memory, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's I just really I like those are the kind of the notes you see in a kid's book or a cookbook are are better than the notes you see in somebody's Bible. Yeah. <laughs> Where they yeah. just usually circle something and 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 right homosexual or negroes next to it or something you know and it's like to justify how they feel or oh uh, yeah yeah i would imagine the the children's book notes are a lot more fun <laughs> yes you know you're surrounded by broken things and broken people and fragments you know and and you know it's like your it's like your sketchbooks <laughs> it's right you don't know what you're gonna find. <laughs> yeah, you... yeah. It's all treasure to be mine. Yeah, yeah. You. you know, we uh, we we all have our torn edges. Yes, we do. Yeah. I like that. I like that um idea and I like that you're sharing like something that's just that's in idea form with me still and with like YouTube the world, because a lot of people are very like close, you know keep things close to their heart until yeah. they're re ready for people to see it. You know, I, I mm -hmm. find it actually kind of rare when people are just like, here's my idea. And like wanting to talk through it, you know, it's, um, I need that sometimes when I, when my multiple personalities aren't helping me out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but that's what, that's what, you know, it's why we have art friends yeah. and, and, you know, and, and people, ins people inspire me a lot to do things. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, having, having a vital art scene is so motivational. Yeah. In so many ways. Yeah. Being part of something. Yeah, absolutely. Not, whatever you define your success as it's, um, it's definitely not financial yeah uh, but i appreciate when i do sell something when someone's brave enough to buy something and uh but if if when i come away from a show and haven't sold but one or two things i, I feel fine still mm -hmm. for the most part um i would feel worse if i wasn't happy with the show yeah you know and it sold out <laughs> yeah then if i yeah was and it didn't sell hardly anything you know it was just... because it wouldn't be like in integrity with yeah. who, who you are as a person and as an artist it goes on your record <laughs> you what it goes on your permanent record right exactly exactly yeah it's like um you're creating for other people versus creating for yourself and then allowing the people who are gonna like can you know feel a resonance with that to you know yeah are you are you out and about in that art scene down in san antonio any i'm not really i'm i'm very much a hermit in a lot of ways and oh. um uh part of me doing these videos is is me like getting you know trying to break that cycle i i much prefer like a one-on-one -on -one good hearty conversation with someone oh. Like an art openings, I like I. It's different. Oh. It's different in Dallas because I know more people and we have a history. Yeah. But um, but art openings are are very like social anxiety producing situations oh. for me. And yeah. um, so I, I mean, there's times where I'm just like, I think I was just a complete freak show at that event. But oh well. I mean, I feel like most of the people there also are in the same boat. <laughs> Every time I talk to other artists about art openings and and the the feeling of being at an art opening, like I don't think I've ever talked to anybody who was just like, yeah, they're great. Like I never, you know, I don't sweat it at all. Like everybody has got something about yeah. it that it is like a little discomfort, you know. Yeah. Um. And it's really like. 
it's not really the best way to look at art you know because there's so much going yeah. on you have to I, I find that um i i go to the openings for support um we run back um and have a day at the galleries to actually yeah. really spend some time with something yeah um, some shows you go more than once and you stuff you know you gather different people make sure they see it because it's you know these artists put a show up yeah it's work you know yeah. And, you know, I I know I know I get you know how sensitive you get when you have a show and it's like you uh, the last show we did it was our it was kind of a retrospective that was dropped in our lap at the last moment we had thirty days yeah I wanted to do work and we did we made the the mask the Halloween mask and from nine thirty in the morning till midnight was us just dropping art off mm -hmm. at, just you know delivering the art to the gallery and then from midnight to noon we were installing it so we were quite exhausted for the opening yeah later on that and and um but and the show was you know up for 30 days and it's it just feels like that's not enough sometimes oh, i was I and my mom's parent too yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's a that's a whole whole thing um that sadly is not that uncommon in the world. No, it's not. And, and people have these, people have these situations. I have a, a bad habit of asking people who have lost their parent that like they, you know, someone tells you they lost their parent. I'm like, I always ask, did you like them? And they're <laughs> put off by that immediately. <laughs> and I'm like, and then they answer, yes, they really liked them as people. And I'm like, that is, that is beautiful, you know? And they, they feel something differently at that point. Yeah. How, how special that is. Yeah. And because um, it's he's you know, it's, I, I loved my mother and I liked one of her personalities and, uh, and her, and her joy was, was always nice to see, but her anger was not. Yeah. Well, maybe doing this this work that you're thinking of will be helpful yeah. for you like putting some of that to rest and like you said you called it your grown-up yeah grown-up work like it like as if what you've been <laughs> doing isn't grown-up work it's playtime yeah. it's playtime but grown-ups are grown-ups are allowed to play too it's but it's cool. like it's almost like like you have this and i'm apologize if I yeah. feel like I'm like, you know, psychoanalyzing or reading into you, you too much. Like, it's just a thing that I, I do tell me to stop if you want me to stop. No. Um, but it's like, um, almost like you haven't felt like you've been able to be a grown up until you kind of like pass this threshold of like, of of dealing with all of that stuff you know De dealing with that child that i was right yeah. yeah i i feel like he that child dealt with things pretty good yeah was, um, yeah I, I think i was lucky on how i dealt with things and uh, one of the things i accidentally did for years was uh when my mom when my mom was out of t out of the house uh, i would take a little nap with my little brother on her waterbed, which had a mirror above mm -hmm. it on the ceiling. And uh, I would just, you know, lay there and let him take a nap. And I would just stare at myself in the mirror until I started hallucinating. Mm. Um, I thought, I'm crazy, just like mom, you, would, you know. You would see like your yourself with double glasses and like all of the, like <laughs> that kind of puts a lot of your artwork in some mm -hmm. new context, you know? It, it 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 and there's there's two ways I, I didn't know what I was doing um for years until I was in Paris, Texas at a gas station and um reading a newspaper. Mm -hmm. I had a friend that was working at the gas station and I was reading the newspaper and it had a big article about what I was doing about yeah. mirror gazing. Yeah. And, and that's what it was. And and um, they had they had the um spiritual explanation for mm -hmm. it, you know that 
is often given like a, you're seeing yourself in a past life transgression or supposedly and um and it's, it's like crystal ball water gazing yeah. um the scientific explanation was um i enjoyed too it was a uh, i was having a deep transcendental meditation mm -hmm. and my subconscious mind was surfacing with and providing hallucinations and um and that i was supposed to give myself um motivational um or, or thoughts for improvement you know because I've, I've hypnotized myself at that point mm -hmm. and so that was that was a godsend in a way you know for that stressed out kid you know to have transcendental meditation on my mom's sexy waterbed <laughs> 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 and uh that's kind of awesome I, I also used to have a hallucinogenic sleep paralysis a lot i had a lot of sleep dispersion and uh that that manifests itself with uh being paralyzed and hallucinating at the same time mm -hmm. and uh, so i i just thought i'm i'm pretty crazy you know this but i'm not i'm not crazy no, you're not you're not i mean <laughs> <an> artist I... <laughs> you're an artist and so you have a, a a blank check to be as eccentric as you want so yeah. that's one thing. And, mm -hmm. um, and another is that I think most people have these kinds of experiences and yeah. either we don't know how to talk about them, or we've like had this culture that shames people mm -hmm. for, ha for having these kinds of experiences. And so we yeah. don't talk about them. Um, or, you know, or you just don't understand what's going on, you know, it can yeah. be overwhelming too so i mean um it sounds like you have you you have some healthy tools in yeah. your your toolbox to I, I don't feel damaged by my experiences i feel mm -hmm. enriched by them i feel uh enlightened mm -hmm. by them. I, I feel like as much as i didn't know my mother I knew her more, mm -hmm. of course, than most people, because I didn't run from a lot of a lot of the other parts of her. Yeah, know? yeah. And I wouldn't even say that was her. I would, my my in my brain as a kid, it was that uh, she was like an actress, and so, but since I had a movie, I was such a movie freak. She's an actress. She's doing this thing. She'll not be that person later on, and she wasn't. And and I would be there to help her clean up the mess. Um, the first time this happened, I had bad behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the first big crazy time my mom had, um, I went and got, a, I got a package of raw bacon out of the refrigerator and me and my brother, older brother were hiding behind the sofa that she had knocked over mm -hmm. and we would jump up and throw raw bacon at her and then hide. And the next day, you know. I'm helping my mom clean the house up. And she's like, where's this bacon coming from? And I'm just, I felt so guilty that, and you know, and I was cleaning it up and I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be that person. Yeah. And, uh, How old do you think you were? Junior high um, yeah. age, probably. Yeah. Maybe 14 or 15. Yeah. I mean, it was a coping mechanism in the moment too. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, your mom uh, coming from wherever she was coming from. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like that, that's all like people, people behaving that way. That's all coming from trauma and wounding as well. It mm -hmm. doesn't, it doesn't, you know, excuse be certain behaviors or whatever. Like, I'm not trying to, to do that, but like, like well, your uh, mother, you said well, you didn't know your mother. Yeah. But it's like she probably didn't know who she was either. Yeah, I don't think she she knew at that moment. Yeah. Um, but that's that's how drugs, whatever I don't know what she was on sometimes, um, and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Um and if you have that pre existing mental condition, yeah, it will just tip you right over that edge. Yeah marijuana never did that to her she was always delightful uh -huh. I wish she was just a pothead yeah. you know and uh um but i i don't 
I don't have a regret for any of it. I, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, not knowing my dad anymore, not, not, not remember, not being able to remember a person, mm -hmm. you know, I'm lucky I can look in the mirror and see a bit of him, yeah. but I don't even know who that is anymore. It, it's, it's really strange. And, uh, but I have, we, we're rich with friendship and, uh, that's for sure. And, I, and, and, it is for sure. Like, you know, I remember talking to you one time at a party, one of our other few like one-on-one -on -one conversations, mm -hmm. it, was, it was brief, but like we were talking about um, just, you know, being an artist and mm -hmm. not making money enough to like to live on and how challenging that is and at times. And, um, and then there's like a lot of truth to that. And I would look like I have sort of this weird mission in my head that I feel like I have to sort of be this advocate and like try to try to shape reshape the world around like its perception of art and artists and appreciation. But, uh, you know, at the same like I remember in that conversation just feeling like um, like the, it was only just maybe like 10 or 12 people there, but there's just like such a love in the room uh -huh. you know and just like um having been to your home so many times and like this was at somebody else's house and it was just like their home was very warm and welcoming and cozy and it's just like you know there's like this there's a different kind of abundance that like and I think that's true for all of us probably like wherever we have um a, a deficit like mm -hmm. in, in one area whether it's like our our family or our finances or whatever like something else like comes in to fill that void and yeah. uh, you know like I, I we were talking about community earlier and like whether or not I like get out and stuff and that, like yep. all of this being part of me wanting to like to expand my art community and part of that also is the fact that I took a break from making art for like 20 years after school and um and like just coming back to it in midlife but like I've been so 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 in my family like uh -huh. past five years for me that's like where all the energy has been like there hasn't really been time and space for like that external community that um I have really missed and it's so necessary and that's why I've been <laughs> reaching out but um yeah it's just kind of like I I just feel like we um I mean I don't know I don't know if that there's any human being on the planet that just kind of is like yeah all my buckets are full you know, <laughs> every single one of them is at equilibrium and ba perfectly balanced, you know, <laughs> like if there's anything in some of them, I'm happy, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to, it's easy to talk yourself out of what little enjoyment you might get mm -hmm. out of some guilt or, um, I don't have children. I have a, I, I um, my, my, Chuck and George is my children. You know, my art is it's wow. children. I'm a bad mother, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, I feel like I'm part of something. Yeah, and and a part of a uh, people and um, just I I I I used to be so shy when I was younger. Mm -hmm. uh, moments of, I had agoraphobia sometimes, and I had just just a lot of fear. Yeah. And, um, it took a while to get out of that. Um, I had to make some friends first. Yeah. All the friends, I had a few friends in high school and they all died strange, mysterious deaths one after another, like a horror movie. Mm -hmm. um, two were decapitated, murdered, separate murders. And one was crushed by a bread truck, I guess, a 7-Eleven. And the other one 
just boringly died mowing his grandmother's yard because he had asthma and uh that was all my friends and yeah. i thought i thought people died all the time because i had a lot of deaths in the family and and i just i kept thinking everybody i met is just gonna get crushed by a bread truck or something you know i was a uh what do you call it a nihilistic is that is that it or just i uh i i but i started thinking of people as just being so temporary mm -hmm. at moments and friendships and so i i uh i started making some connections that were probably bad you know like like um people that didn't die early enough to not <laughs> cause such misery or something <laughs> but uh you know just toxic relationships in a way but also just treating your loved ones like this may be your last words with them you know yeah 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 and, uh the bread the bread truck deaths bothered me the most strangely enough um because i worked at a 7-eleven and every time the bread truck would come i would get very upset and my yeah. boss would get mad at me because i'm crying why are you crying every time the bread trucks here? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like because because yeah. somebody else got crushed by a bread truck yeah know? and like the absurdity of it too like it's not yeah. just a truck it's a bread truck you know i didn't make paintings out of it you know and, yeah. Uh, yeah and it, it, those are the kind of things i need to i have i have i'm rich with that material and uh it's stupid how much stuff is in that life of mine yeah that felt like I didn't have much of anything sometimes yeah but it was there it was a lot of crazy yeah and we Chuck and George addresses um our our childhoods in ways um but nothing nothing too deep just yeah. um there's usually an inclusion of possibly you know favorite toys you know uh little it's a little sneaky secretive things we put into the the art that is yeah. just code coded things and uh, uh and and it, without saying too much or even anything so <laughs> i don't know there's like a fleshiness to <laughs> to your work that's just sort of like um you know it's like going into I don't know what this ex experience is like for for men, but like going into the Target dressing room is like a known thing for women is like a space of horror because <laughs> the lighting in that oh. place is going to show just like every yeah. little dimple and like vein under your skin and just like oh. all of it. And like, that's yeah. how like, your paintings are. It's just like, there's like this yeah. fleshiness to this like, exaggerated grotesque level that after talking with you and hearing some of these stories like that kind of takes on a different uh meaning for me mm -hmm. of just like the the body and like the body as a vessel of, of life and um and this the the grossness of that mm -hmm in a lot of ways you know um and yet there's like this very playful fun part of it as well <laughs> it's like both of these threads are going in there it's it's also got an eight-year-old's cruelty to it you know where you're and, and there's moments sometimes and when i'm painting something that is quite cruel in a way, and, it, and one of them it was the cat painting I did for a feral cat uh, colony uh, money raising show. I did the most hideous cat I could imagine that was just living through such harshness. And, uh, you know, it was this horrible little cat. You could see its ribs and it, it was very auto dicks. You know, its tail was broken and there was flies on it and it had just given birth and it was already eating them you yeah. know everything was all stretched out and blown out and it was just it made me laugh yeah while making it. and it, I felt I'm like why am I laughing at this cruelty I just it was like 
I was enjoying it. I was enjoying it. It was definitely this eight-year-old brain in my head, mm. enjoying something about that misery. And I didn't really, I don't really understand it, honestly. You know? Yeah. And uh, it's it's more of a cartoon of misery. Yeah. And because uh, I, I wanted people to see, you know, instead of painting kit, cute little kittens or a feral cat colony, I thought painting the ugliest part of what a, a feral cat colony is right yeah, yeah. And, and nobody bought it <laughs> I, I feel like um yeah you probably have that challenge with a lot of your artwork of like what 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 <laughs> what do people want to live with <laughs> yes. so it's like it's like yes this may like uh create a reaction in me that's really powerful and meaningful but do I want that over my bed yeah, yeah you know like where I'm trying to be calm and not have nightmares like do you want uh, target lighting in your bedroom <laughs> right exactly exactly <laughs> no yeah. you're not um but but there's a place there's a place for it yeah you know for what you're doing and I, and whether or not somebody's bedroom is the right place for it <laughs> like that's okay uh, um, uh, make a door um often in a bathroom is usually where um, a lot of my work ends up sometimes. A lot of Brian's work ends up behind a bedroom door, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and I, I love that we have our house open to people and they just come through not knowing what they're getting into sometimes. Right. But, uh, yeah. And I do love that. I, I, I've been wanting to make um, official Chuck and George barf bags, like little airplane barf bags. Right. For people to, in, in memory, you know, a souvenir, but also right. in case they get sick from looking at all the art, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we had an interview with the Nasher um, Museum, and they they we're in their next um, magazine for right. winter, and it's and it's a it's a, our house is what we had a show up when they wanted to do interview us, but we had to bring it all back and put it back in the house. Uh huh. They were interested in the house, not the art. <laughs> yeah. But like so, I said earlier, the house is art. The art. I know. Yeah. Um, we had kitchen cabinet doors. Our kitchen cabinet doors were in the show. Um uh, so that's like in the show, it's art, but in our house it's kitchen cabinets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh and I I I did we did get the uh the person writing about it to look at both the show and the art that way they can see it both of you know the art and the and the kitchen cabinets you know wow. um so that's something to look for coming up we don't have any shows scheduled right now um i need to work on a solo show um and brian needs to do a solo show um my my uh gallery person uh, the owner of my gallery had told me a while back that if I don't have a a, a show coming up soon, people will forget who I am. Oh. Made me laugh, <laughs> and but um, the gallery has such a the it's row two gallery. Yeah, they have they have such a beautiful big gigantic gallery now. Yeah, I and haven't been to any space yet. Oh, you haven't been. The yeah. art I want to do is small, and so I'm like, you know, I, yeah. So I, I I I might I might do something big and crazy before I do the small stuff. That way I can uh not sell anything, but who knows? Yeah. What is a museum collectible piece? I think it might be a big text thing because it's a solo yeah. piece. But, um I, I was not thinking I would ever do another big text, but the space is so large that I want to do something really gigantic, sculptural. Yeah. That, an actual, oh. I'm going to do an actual big text. <laughs> oh, I'm getting excited about that. We didn't even get to talk about big text. Okay, um, really quickly so that I can end this video, like tell me about the wall behind you. Um, The wall behind me, I'm not on mirror. So this is, um, I'm going to move the camera. Okay. That is a piece from my last big text show. Ew. Um where it was uh, inspired i had i had a big during the pandemic and um i was kind of on the wrong direction for it and um 
I was really depressed about the pandemic and and the uh, poli- nature of politics nowadays and people that I I was really not really wanting to do a big tech show, but at, at that moment, at that second, and but then I I thought I'm gonna do uh, a kind of a punk rock they live version of it from the John Carpenter's movie, and uh, and it's an animated. So there is a GIF online, but there was like 30 something pieces. And um, when you put the paintings together, they become an animation. Yeah, I did. I contributed to that. Yeah. Yeah. You did a wonderful job. And and that was a really fun thing we did. That's another big tech show that I think that one was a failure. I I made it look like it was in it's this portrait of me always, but I made it look like it was in a uh, one of those uh, convex mirrors like at a yeah. at a carnival. That's one of our masks from our uh uh Chuck and George show. And this is Chuck and George piece right there. That's uh based on Halloween. We use ping pongs a lot in our art by the way <laughs> and in our costumery. And those are printed on their uh relief prints printed on velvet. Oh wow and, and hand colored that was for our show for the Velvetorium that we had, which is, there's the sign for it. Nice. But let me turn it on real quick. Woo! There we go. There you go. So that's, that's what the art looks like when we bring it back home. We, we always, we, um, you know, you, you can only put so much, uh, of the art that makes it back to your house um, in, in so many places, you don't want to fill your attic up with your failure art, so to speak. And so we always have a place for everything to go, including the floor cloths, yeah. the, table, the table that we make. And Oh, I love that table. I haven't seen that. The snake. The two-headed snake. It's kind of a game, but I don't know how to play it. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I'm in Dallas, I'm gonna I want to come over and let's get some dice and some little game pieces and we're gonna yeah, we're gonna figure out the rules to that game. See if I can put my if you're up for it. Hey. I'll bring I'll bring a cheese ball, a homemade cheese ball. How about that? Sweeten cheese the pot. <laughs> we could we could use it like a crystal ball. Yeah, we could. <laughs> I like uh, it. 